have the heart on. Perfect world was a dream. Primitive He's a traitor. He's a traitor. You're all going to die down here. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Welcome with kindness and love to Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. An initiation by conversation into the dark corners of myth, magic, and meaning. A crash course in cult, culture, and conspiracy. A virtuous virus invoking and informing history, holiness, and heresy. Each week, we commandeer your connection to bring the most accepted and rejected scholars and provocateurs to your attention. Fun, compelling, and deeply weird, this is the blow your mind cocktail party conversation you always wanted to listen in on. To be inspired to resurrect your inner artist and indwelling inventor and innermost performer. To eradicate all manner of spiritual boredom in high places and do better than the creator gods and their insipid startup realities. Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy shit we don't need. Despite what New Age and Orthodox haters might say, the Gnostic way is the most positive way. After all, it's only when you realize how bad things are, how low you've come down in the chain of being of the Neoplatonists, that you will get off your monkey ass and do something about it. Not get lulled by your iPhone, Netflix binge-watching, mating with the next-door neighbor, or the useless, quote, make the best of it attitude that has infected most faiths. As they say in AA, you know you've hit rock bottom when you stop digging. Unfortunately, humanity as a collective isn't close to letting go of their shovels. But you are because you just can't stomach having your standards lowered yet again by the powers and principalities. You just can't. And now you can tackle those existentialist and ontological and moral problems that keep humanity asleep at the shovel. And you can start reaching out to the least of your brothers. That's not world hating, that's world restoring, my beloved true seekers. A world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries. A world where anything is possible. I like this quote I saw on some Tumblr page, riffing from that famous rap song. It goes, I got 99 problems, and being trapped in a decaying body, in a money-hungry society, on a dying planet, in a mysterious dimension, might be one. The Gnostic vibe would say this is good news indeed, because now you see the truth, and now you can get some elbow gnosis grease and fix it. Then focus on the other 98 problems that are probably worse. Eh, nobody said being a champion eternal, true seeker warrior, or incarnation of Abraxas would be easy. Like Jim Morrison sang, no one gets out alive. But as a Valentinian's countered, perhaps some stay here, transformed into living Christ. By the power of truth, I, while living, have conquered the universe. The Gnostic ethos is not for everyone, however, and alas. If you feel that God is everything, or in everything, like child porn, a pile of vomit, or ISIS sex slave commerce, then turn this show off right now. 
If you feel God works in mysterious ways or plays hide and seek with himself, including in the Zika virus, hurricanes, and the reboot of Full House, then return to Maya and materialism. Forget to ever become a spiritual entrepreneur that can disrupt the monopolies of hating angels. Keep those buttons over your eyes as happens to the denizens of the other world in the Gnostic gospel known as Coraline. Oh, and while you're at it, check out my article on Coraline and other recent posts on all things Gnostic at the God Above God Dead Kin. Horror and moral terror are your friends. I am and I am Abraxas in his meat space incarnation of Miguel Connor. And you are Abraxas too, beyond your incarnation. And together we're going into the most positive journey ever through the gnashing rocks of orthodoxy, all the way to the farthest shores of imagination. We're going to do so many wonders together. I just know it. I just know it. Are you ready for a near-life experience? Yes, these are bruises from fighting. Yes, I'm comfortable with that. I am enlightened. On this June, the year of our Demiurge 2016, on show number 330, we get all Art of War by understanding the enemy. And that enemy is Jehovah, or the Demiurge, or Sackless, or Yaldabaoth, or Samel, or your abusive father that night in the tool shed with its breath stinking of bushmills and peanuts. I am the architect. I created the Matrix. I've been waiting for you. Jehovah gets a pointed but poignant biography in the form of a new book entitled How God Became God. What scholars are really saying about God and the Bible. It's written by Richard Smoley, a sage philosopher like none other who graces once again the virtual Alexandria. Check out Richard's past shows at our various channels like iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or the Archive of Past Shows on many mind-expanding, reality-disbanding topics. For more information on Richard, please visit innerchristianity.com. That is innerchristianity.com. We've certainly dealt for years on the cosmic monkey shines and horns woggle of the Demiurge, the son of Sophia and creator of this counterfeit dream we call reality. Slugs! He created slugs. They can't hear, they can't speak, they can't operate machinery. I mean, are we not in the hands of a lunatic? I like this quote by Joseph Campbell that summarizes the Supreme Being very well from the standpoint of us being true artists. It goes, One problem with Yahweh, as they used to say in the old Christian Gnostic text, is that he forgot he was a metaphor. He thought he was a fact. And when he said, I am God, a voice was heard to say, you are mistaken, Samael. Samael means blind God, blind to the infinite light of which he is a local historical manifestation. This is known as the blasphemy of Jehovah, that he thought he was God. Our job as Nostikoi is to remind the old man he's a metaphor. And remember that we are higher than metaphors, a shard of infinity of the cosmic man of the Kabbalah and Manichaeanism that connected can transcend all reality and unreality. Like Mary Magdalene says in the Nag Hammadi Library's Dialogue with the Savior, there is but one saying I will speak to the Lord concerning the mystery of truth. 
In this we have taken our stand, and to the cosmic are we transparent. And like Carl Jung said concerning our sacred and profane quest, taking a more Valentinian approach on how we can assist the old man in regaining the sanity he lost when Sophia slash Athena left his mind? Quote, For the alchemist, the one primarily in need of redemption is not man, but the deity who is lost in sleeping in matter. It's not an easy thing to meet your maker. And what can he do for you? And the maker repair what he makes. You were made as well as we could make you. But not to last. The light that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And you have burned so very, very brightly, Roy. But you gotta keep it separated, as Offspring sang. Which reminds me of this passage from the Gospel of Thomas. A departing from the synoptic gospels, and which many scholars say it's a bona fide Gnostic stratum of the fifth gospel. It goes, Jesus said to them, Give the emperor what belongs to the emperor, give God what belongs to God, and give me what is mine. After all, wasn't it Tom Waits who said, There ain't no devil? only God when he's drunk. Call no man happy who is not dead. God likes to watch. Your mileage may vary, but this is the situation we're in. That one of 99 problems, going against omnipotent and omniscient beings who control all the kingdoms of the world and deny us a cure for cancer or a reboot of Firefly. Now that you know this, as I said, this is good news, and you can finally do something about it. And with Richard Sophia in our interview, it will be a lot easier, as it gets a lot easier every week you come to the virtual Alexandria. But enough of my Pandoric drivel and abuse of quotes. Let us do the interview with Richard Smoley on his new great book, How God Became God. Write your own gospel, live your own myth. Or someone else will, and that might be Jehovah in the tool shed with his breath stinking of bushmills and peanuts. Suppose it's all true, mm. and you walk up to the pearly gates, and you are confronted by God. What will Stephen Fry say to him, her, or it? I will basically, what's known as theodicy, I think, I, I'll say, bone cancer in children? What's that about? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world which is so full of injustice and pain? That's what I'd say. And you think you're going to get in no, on that? but I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to get in on his terms. They're wrong. Now, if I died and it was, it was Pluto, Hades, and if it was the 12 Greek gods, then I would have more truck with it because the Greeks were they didn't pretend not to be human in their appetites and in their capriciousness and in their unreasonableness. They didn't present themselves as being all-seeing, all-wise, all-kind, all-beneficent. Because the God who created this universe, if it was created by God, is quite clearly a maniac, utter maniac, totally selfish, totally... We have to spend our life on our knees thanking him? What kind of God would do that? Yes, the world is very splendid, but it also has in it insects whose whole life cycle is to burrow into the eyes of children and make them blind. They eat outwards from the eyes. Why? Why did you do that to us? You could easily have made a, a creation in which that didn't exist. It is simply not acceptable. What kind of God is he? It's perfectly apparent that he is monstrous, utterly monstrous, and deserves no respect whatsoever. The moment you banish him, your life becomes simpler, purer, cleaner, more worth living in. 
This is the AM Byte interview, and we have the pleasure, as always, of being joined by Richard Smoley, this time to discuss his new book, How God Became God, What Scholars Are Really Saying About God and the Bible. How are you doing today, Richard? I'm very well. It's great to be back. Always a pleasure. So tell us about why you decided to write the book. I have uh, read all of your books, even before Aeon Bite. I had already read Inner Christianity and Forbidden Faith. I've enjoyed your works and followed, followed them throughout the years. This seems to be more of your, uh, might say, laser-focused books. Because usually in your books, Richard, you like to uh, take a spanning view of a concept or a religion. You like to go throughout history. You like to go sideways and uh, parallel it to Asian themes and so forth. This seems, again, your most most focused book because you uh, decided to write about a specific God in a specific religion and really a specific time. Why did you uh, see the need to do this? Well, there are a lot of books about God on the market, uh, and there, at the same time, is still a lot of confusion, particularly about the Bible, uh, which is pretty much the source of Western civilization's concept of God. And one thing is that's very confusing to many people is just how literally true the Bible is. Now, you know, most educated people realize that Genesis uh, is uh, not, a, a, you know, a factual account of how the universe was created, although it does have um, a great deal of uh, profundity about it. Um, so, you know, most people sort of say, yeah, well, I guess we don't really believe that uh, the universe was created 6,000 years ago. But how much of the rest of it is literally true, according to what make uh, a vague, or, uh, you know, a, a reasonable scholarly consensus? And this book is just an attempt to do that, just to take what scholars are saying about these subjects and put them out in a fairly a clear and concise way, because you can read a lot of books about God and Jesus by a lot of experts and still come away wondering about this stuff. So I just simply gone through it step by step and said, well, all right, what parts of it are now believed to be literally true? Uh, now, I'm, you know, trying to reflect um, a reasonably intelligent mainstream scholarly consensus, but there are areas in which I personally differ with this consensus. And, um, you know, when I do, I say so. So let's start about how God, uh, how God started in your uh, biography of Yahweh. And it seems uh, he's gone full circle because uh, he ends up as a son of God. But as you point out, Yahweh really began as a son of God. Yeah, it's a very um, intricate picture. Yahweh is the proper name of the Old Testament God or at least one of the proper names of the God of the Old Testament. Um, where did he come from? Well, he apparently came from an area called Midian. And this is in present day, northwestern Saudi Arabia, southern Jordan. And well, where was Midian uh, in those days? It was uh, on the edge of uh, the Egyptian empire. You'll remember uh, that Midian was where Moses fled to when he went to Egypt. And it was also where he uh, had that experience um, uh, of God or Yahweh on the mountain. One plausible explanation is that Yahweh started out as a god of the Midianite League. Now, this gets, uh, who's, you know, a bunch of tribes, um, and the uh, Hebrews got it from that, or Moses, as little as we know about him, got it from, got, um, got this god from them. Um, now, what's curious is there's always, there are always, in a sense, two gods, and, you know, in a sense, you're, uh, you know, even the, the title of your, um, the god above god, uh, right. you know, reflects that. One is the absolute reality, which is, as everybody knows or should know, is inconceivable and immeasurable and beyond our conceptual grasp. That much said, we do and will naturally have concepts uh, that, uh, of this God. They are necessarily limited 
but at the same time, we're not going to do anything um, about that. That is the way we apprehend the world. And you could say that these concepts become idols in the time of the Bible. Uh, people, at least ostensibly, thought that these um, you know, physical idols were gods. I, I doubt it's quite so simple as that, but that's, that's at least the way the Bible portrays it, you know, which they had mistaken for the real thing. Similarly, we and the Hebrews uh, in the Old Testament times did the same thing. We mistake our concepts for the absolute unity. Yahweh was one of these concepts. In those days also, um, nations had ruling gods, uh, and Yahweh was the ruling god of Israel. When the, the Hebrews are told to worship him alone, uh, it, it did not necessarily mean, at least at first, that these other gods didn't exist. But these other gods belong to other nations, and it was presumably the other nations' business whether they worship them or not. So it was what's often called henotheism. That is to say, it, um, it's not a belief in one god specifically, but it is the worship of one god specifically. And later in, on, this kind of Yahweh figure eventually was assimilated to the high god, who was in those traditions was called El, and that's the name is translated as God. So you'll see something like, you'll say, well, the Lord is God. Well, you know, if you read about this in an English Bible, this is a, a rather unremarkable statement. But if you go back and says Yahweh is El, it's kind of a revolutionary statement because they're saying our national God is the high God. All the other gods are false. And that is how monotheism as we know it arose. Uh, it was a, uh, shall we say, a, um, a problem that was started by the uh, writers of the Old Testament. And this it's passed on to uh, the children of Judaism, such as uh Christianity and Islam, and this idea that not only is there one God, but there's only my concept of God or my religion's concept of God is uh, a source of great um, suffering, persecution, and hatred. And, um, you know, that explains a great deal of the last 2,000 years. A very fascinating point you bring up, Richard, and uh, I have heard this also from uh, scholars of mythology and anthropologists, is the way the ancients view the world, which is very different from us. Uh, we, are, we create categories immediately. We're a very left brain, borrowing from Gary Lockman. Mm -hmm. And in ancient times, it wasn't so. For example, when a man saw uh, a bear, he saw both a god, an animal, food, uh, and a threat. That wasn't a problem. So for the ancients, it was no problem seeing Yahweh as a god, uh, the ground of being, an angel, a man, or a storm, wasn't it? No. Uh, I guess that would be the case. But, you know, again, what happens is the idea gets kind of increasingly fixed. And, um, you know, the idea that everyone else's gods are um, false um, you know, starts to become problematic, and it became problematic for the Jews. Now, there's, um, in, uh, what was it, 167 BC, a Hellenistic king, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, tried to set up an altar and possibly an image of Zeus in the Jerusalem temple. This was an abomination, and it caused an enormous revolt. Now, in a way that could seem very impious, and it did to the Jews, but conceivably what Antiochus was doing was saying, well, what the Jews worship as Yahweh is what we call Zeus. So that's fine. And so let me just put an altar to Zeus since they're worshiping Zeus anyway under his own name. Uh, but the Jews didn't see it that way. And, um, you know, caused an enormous revolt, and um, the Jews happened to succeed in that particular revolt, but th there were a lot of others in which they didn't succeed. So it's, it's interesting, um, you know, it's interesting to say, you know, the, the pagans uh, were fairly, they, they were completely accommodating, um, and they naturally assumed everybody worshipped the same gods. Like, if you look at Caesar's Gallic War, 
where he describes the, the habits and practices of the Gauls at the beginning of the book. He says, well, their chief god is, is Mercury or something like that. Um, did they worship the Roman Mercury as the Romans knew? No, but they had a god who probably was something like, you know, maybe the Norse equivalent of Odin, who the Romans said, well, this is pretty much like Mercury. So they're worshiping Mercury. So, okay, uh, the Jews would not go for this. Uh, and as it were, they invented kind of the monotheism that we have today, which, you know, has a certain truth in that, yes, there is this kind of unified ground being that is one. Um, but there are also little conceptual problems with it, too, meaning that my God is the only God. Uh, and that's caused a lot of unhappiness. Indeed, and still does. And one theme that you bring up, you even say this theme keeps appearing towards your book or as you were writing the book, and that is of Yahweh being the great angel based on uh, Margaret Barker's great book, The Great Angel. Could you tell us about that one, Richard? Yeah, well, to go back to this idea that every nation had a ruling God, Yahweh was the ruling God of Israel. Now, there's an interesting, this is in Deuteronomy 32.8, and although the English translations distort this, what it, and in fact, the Hebrew text distorts this, what it's really saying is, is that El apportioned the gods, or the angels, or the sons of God. Angels and sons of God were basically synonymous. The son of God meant angel in those days. El apportioned Yahweh to Israel. So Yahweh was the ruling angel of Israel. And this idea survived in the Kabbalah. Uh, and you will hear, um, you know, medieval Kabbalists, you know, write about, you know, each nation having its own ruling angel. Uh, but, in the, but the difference of the Jews as well, we, uh, eventually this angel became assimilated to the high God. Now, what's, what's kind of interesting about this is that when the Hebrews decided that um, Yahweh was El, this great angel he, didn't exactly go away. He stayed on in the Jewish tradition as, and one name for him was the great angel. Uh, he appears in uh, Philo, uh, a Jewish author who's contemporary with Jesus. Uh, he appears in Jewish mystical texts of um, that period. Under many, in fact, Philo calls him the archangel of many names. Some of these names at the time of Christ were the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Logos, the Word. Is this starting to sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. And that this angel was who the Christians who wrote the New Testament thought Jesus was. They thought he was the incarnation of this great angel. The idea of the Trinity had not been invented yet. And if you read the New Testament in this light, it becomes clear in a way that it is not in any other way. Now, what happened, and this is the theology of the early Christians. We're talking about John, we're talking about Paul, we're talking about the epistle to the Hebrews, um, pretty, you know, pretty much the whole of the New Testament. This great angel, the Son of God, the Word, Logos, incarnated in Jesus, and he, in some mysterious way, uh, died for our sins. This is never really explained, um, uh, or for that matter, understood, I suspect. But, so he died, he was resurrected, and he, was, he ascended to the right hand of God. Before, he had just been below God. And because of this act, according to Christians, he was elevated to the right hand of God, so he was more or less equal with God. That is the theology of the New Testament. Uh, you have to set aside the belief in the Trinity and uh, a lot of later things um, if you're going to understand it. Now, of course, this is not widely grasped even among scholars because most scholars are still seeing, th even the most authoritative are to some extent seeing um, uh, through um, you know, a denominational lens you know, we're talking about uh, people who, you know, have been trained in divinity schools and seminaries that, you know, one way or another, things like the, the, the um, you know, mainstream tradition of the Trinity, you know, kind of lingered around. So um, this is very difficult to see. 
Um, but a few scholars have seen it. I mean, Bart Ehrman in his um, How uh, Jesus Became God uh, says something rather like this, although a bit more um, vaguely and cautiously. And this idea even survived or even was transferred through Paul, right? I mean, Paul himself writes about, and well, and, it's, and those who write in his name, right. writes about uh, the powers and the principalities, the angels handing the Torah to Moses. And I'm paraphrasing here, but you quote uh, a scholar who says that Marcion, the great uh, second century heretic, simply took Paul's idea to their natural con logical conclusion, which Paul seems to be avoiding that, yes, the angels are managing this universe. Yeah, and both in Judaism, both in Judaism and uh, in Paul, the angels are extremely um, equivocal and ambiguous figures. Paul never speaks of the angels in a positive way. Never. They are always law secondhand lawgivers. They are, um, you know possible opponents, they are obstacles. Um, and this tradition also survived in Judaism um, there, because there's a lot uh, in the later Kabbalah about um, a kind of mutual envy and um, uh, opposition between the angels and man. In fact, one interpretation of the most famous of Christ's parables, the prodigal son, alludes to this. Because you'll remember there's this prodigal son who goes off into, you know, you know a, a foreign country and, and um, wastes his inheritance and so on. But there's a son that stays. And this son who stays isn't exactly too happy when the prodigal returns and is welcomed by his father. By some interpretations, this elder son symbolizes the angels who never left. The prodigal son is us who descended into this foreign country, which is you know, life on uh, the material plane. Um, so there's this always this tension. Um, some Jewish texts, uh, even later ones, are written in Aramaic rather than Hebrew. And one reason sometimes alleged for this is um, the angel, so as not to make the angels jealous of uh, that you have this mystical knowledge, because the angels understand Hebrew, or, although it was believed they didn't understand Aramaic. So this opposition of the angels to humanity is something that's kind of very, very unfamiliar uh, to Christians who, you know, today an angel is like, you know, some kind of mysterious being who appears and saves you from a car wreck. Uh, they didn't really see things that way. They saw things much more ambiguously. And for Paul, the law was given by angels. I mean, he, he, he specifically says this in Galatians. And... The law is not necessarily um, uh, for humans' benefit either, because, of course, I wouldn't, he says, I wouldn't have known uh, sin except for the law. So in a way, that was kind of a trap. Uh, and that's why he's so vehemently opposed, uh, particularly for Gentiles, um, uh, to obey the Jewish law. And that is why he broke with Judaism in um, the way he did. And Richard, your book, uh, again, is it, uh, it's very detailed on the history of God in the Old Testament. And uh, what some people might not know is that Yahweh did have a, you might say, a Mrs. Yahweh, or I guess Margaret Barker, she argues that he was a hermaphrodite God, kind of like the archons in the secret book of John or the origins of the world. So tell us a bit about uh, Yahweh's uh, wife. Well... The archaeology, of course, uh, you know, particularly with the Hebrew Bible, doesn't always jibe with um, what the Bible says or what um, people have concluded from this Bible. Um, and like, there's one very early uh, inscription that says basically something like, this is an offering to Yahweh and his Asherah. Now, Asherah was actually um, a goddess. and it would seem that for many, many, many Hebrews uh, of the pre-exilic period, that is before 586 BC, they worshipped this divine consort along with Yahweh. Now, it gets, it, what, it, is this plausible? Well, in a way, yeah, um, because the Bible itself uh, keeps talking about um, groves. You'll see uh, uh, 
in, in many, uh, at least some translations, these mention of groves in the Old Testament and certain kings cut down the groves. Well, these weren't really groves. They were um, wooden images of Asherah. They were in the temple uh, also for most of the temple. The, that is the, the temple of Solomon for most of its history before it was um, destroyed in 586. So now we're left with kind of two possibilities. One is that way back when this very shadowy figure named Moses gave the law to Israel and um, told them to worship Yahweh only, and that sometimes they obeyed, sometimes they didn't, they slid back a lot, um, and it's brought all sorts of um, evil upon them. That is what the Bible says. Scholars do, and sometimes will argue, that this isn't really the way it happened that this monotheism evolved out of, you know, basically what I'd called before a henotheism in which Asherah was very present. Um, she sometimes identified with another um, Near Eastern goddess called Astarte, the queen of heaven. And there's a funny verse in Jeremiah after the temple has been destroyed. Jeremiah says, well, you, it was destroyed because you were worshiping the queen of heaven in your temple. And the people said, well, we're going to still worship her because frankly, when the Queen of Heaven was worshipped in the temple, um, everything was good. We had plenty of food and we were safe. Then we kicked her out and now everything is horrible. Our country is destroyed and we're starving. And they literally say this to Jeremiah. So um, that would imply that for a lot, a lot of Israelites before the exile, Asherah, Astarte, you know, uh, these goddesses were uh, very much part of the... Um, uh, temple worship and uh, the Israelite religion. Uh, but after the exile, what some people call the Yahweh alone party won the day. These are the ones who put the Bible together. So we see everything from that point of view. Asherah, the, 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 this goddess, also lingered uh, and in, in various forms. In the, again, in the Kabbalah, which, as I've said several times, you know, does preserve a lot of the most ancient teachings of Judaism. You know, she became personified as the Shekinah, uh, the presence. Uh, there was also a figure called Wisdom, who, uh, if you see from the book of Proverbs, is a divine is a feminine figure. Now, and this might be metaphorical, because the uh, Hebrew word for wisdom, hokmah, is feminine. So it was more naturally to speak of Hakma as a female, but it's also quite possible that this um, Sophia figure bore some traces of this goddess whose worship had been um, uh, eliminated. You mentioned, Richard, the uh, exile, the Babylonian exile in the 5th century, and this seems to be a pivotal time in uh, the biography of God and uh, the Jewish people. You even write how Satan only appears in texts written during and after the exile. What exactly happened in the exile that changed the course of uh, how they saw God? Well, Satan is certainly one uh, major, shall we say, innovation one problem many people have with the Old Testament is that Yahweh is um, himself a somewhat ambivalent figure. He, you know, tempts David to uh, uh, conduct a census and then punishes him and the people for doing just that. Uh, if people are tempted by our people are tempted by evil spirits, uh, these will often be described as evil spirit from the Lord, that is from Yahweh, came to them. Now, that was the way it was, because, and it's natural, because if you really do believe in one God, you eventually are going to have to, you know, one ground of being, you have, you're going to have to grant that um, everything comes from it, including both what we call good and what we call evil. As time went on, um, people began to have more trouble assimilating this. So a figure... Uh, was introduced called Satan, which originally means the opponent, the adversary, uh, the opposition. And he was, by consensus of most scholarship, probably brought in from Zoroastrianism, the Persian uh, ancient 
Persian dualistic religion, which posited, you know, kind of a war between the light and the darkness. The uh, dark god in uh, Zoroastrianism was called Araman, and uh, this concept was kind of brought into Judaism. So later on, you know, it, before the, before uh, the exile, you could you know they could write Yahweh tempted David to conduct a census. After, and this is in Chronicles, which was written later than the Book of Kings, it will say Satan tempted David. The Satan figure wasn't around. Uh, and Job, uh, which is really the, the place in which Satan appears kind of most prominently in the Hebrew Bible, it, its date is very problematic. But again, it, it, most uh, scholars would date it to around the time of the exile. Uh, when we're talking about the 6th century BC, in 586, the Babylonians invaded Judah, the land of the Jews, destroyed the temple, and dragged at least its leading citizens off to Babylon for, what was it, uh, maybe a little under 50 years. And this was kind of when all of this uh, percolated into Judaism and after. So it, ch it changed quite a bit because God then became exclusively good. And this devil figure was um, branded uh, with all the evil. Um, this doesn't solve the problem of evil all that well because, well, God must have, you know, if God is the one God, he must have created Satan too, and he must have created at least the possibility for evil. But uh, I guess it was felt to be more comforting or at least more graspable by the human mind. Moving on to the New Testament, Richard, uh, let's let's talk about uh, Jesus, the, uh, the, the the as you say, the incarnation of the great angel. And as you point out, there's a lot of problems. <laughs> you write in one part, uh, the Jerusalem Daily Bugle wasn't able to report exactly what happened in 33 AD. Mm -hmm. So now we get to the problem of Jesus. And um, uh, again, as you point out, Albert Schweitzer, he wrote how Jesus was probably an apocalypse apocalyptic teacher. And this is the view that Bart Ehrman has today, and it seems to be more of the, the probably the most popular view. Do you see Jesus as an apocalyptic teacher, or do you see him or a preacher, or what problems do you see with this viewpoint? Well, one problem is there is one part of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, called the Apocalyptic Discourse. It's found in Matthew 21, Mark 13, I'm sorry, Matthew 24, um, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And these are all, this is, you know, identifiably the same speech. And this is where Jesus predicts the end of the world. Uh, of course, there are all sorts of problems with this, like, did he really say this or this put in his mouth later? Because it looks like what he's saying, if you just read it, cold, this apocalyptic discourse, it sounds very, very much like Jesus is predicting the destruction of the temple, the second temple this time that was rebuilt by the Romans, followed by the end of the world. Um, well, now, lots of questions abound. One, did, did Jesus really predict the sack of the temple 40 years before it happened? Well, um, most scholars say he probably didn't. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a prophecy that was kind of, um, shall we say, cooked up after the event. Um, so, all right, well, you, you're going to take that out, right? That's kind of a major chunk of what Jesus says as an apocalyptic prophet. So on the one hand, you're saying, um, Jesus probably didn't say most of the things in this apocalyptic discourse. So I'm going to bracket it and set it aside. So, all right, you've just thrown out all of his apocalyptic sayings, Right. Uh, so and then you're kind of around, turning around and trying to tell, uh, tell us that Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet. What is wrong with this picture? You know, there are lots of confusions uh, because, of course, Jesus does talk a great deal about the kingdom of God. But it turns out that this kingdom of God is not political, contrary to what some authors would have you say. Um, it's not even necessarily eschatological, that is to say, having to do with the last things. The kingdom of God is within you. And a lot of the uh, parables about the kingdom 
are about some kind of internal state. It's like a seed. It's 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 um, like leaven. Um, the, this is not an apocalyptic event that's coming. This is this is an interior thing, and so it was always known in the, the esoteric Christian tradition, uh, going back to the earliest times. Scholars today can't really put their hands around this because they have no real concept of what an inner life might be like in this sense. So, well, of course, then the kingdom of God has to be apocalyptic. So that's how they get Jesus as an apocalyptic prophet, although, you know, they've thrown out most of the, his apocalyptic sayings on the one hand and, you know, are really stretching this concept of the kingdom of God uh, to make it apocalyptic on the other. So I, I don't think it's terribly sustainable. Uh, certainly not as the core of Jesus' message. But basically, we really can't say who Jesus was. I mean, there's there's many theories. Jesus the Stoic, Jesus the political uh, activist, and you mentioned scholars. I believe Reza Aslan is one who advocates that position. Uh, Jesus the, uh, the went to India and brought mysticism. It doesn't seem we can find out, and you seem to say that the best thing is to be more or less agnostic, or as one of your sayings, and you say it in your book, and I've heard you say it in lectures, either the attitude of neither accept nor deny. Yeah, well, that's certainly the case. I, it seems to me impossible at this point, uh, you know, to, to give any kind of fine lens view of what Jesus said or didn't say. All the same, if you're treating this as a historical problem, right? We're talking about the historical Jesus, right? Right. Well, if you're doing history... You have primary sources. These are the closest sources you have to your material. Um, no, there weren't any newspapers. And if if you know some other text actually crops up and tells us something, well, um, great. Let's we'll fix fix it in the picture then. But you know, no text has turned up uh, that's been all that informative. So we are left with the Gospels as primary sources. And one way in which I kind of differ from many scholars is um, I think one has to have at least some respect for these sources because they're the best sources we have. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that I'm willing to accept the core narrative of the Gospels in a way that many scholars don't appear to want to do. Like what? Like who wanted to have Jesus killed? Well, the earliest sources, the Gospels, this is multiply attested, and it's attested early, uh, and those are very important criteria uh, in historical um, uh, criticism, uh, say that it was the priests who wanted to have Jesus killed. They, you know, Pilate, you know, Pontius Pilate, the wicked Roman procurator, didn't really care that much about one way or another. Um, and, you know, he said, well, you know, if you really want to, uh, sure, what the hell, we'll have him crucified. That's, that's the way uh, the Gospels sound. Um, but there's a lot of reluctance to say that it was the priests rather than the Romans who wanted to have Jesus crucified um, for a number of reasons. One is it totally throws out any political uh, motive um, for Jesus' behavior. And they can't really accept that. If you, have, you can only see Jesus in some kind of quasi-political light, what are you going to do? You just have to get, you know, say, well, it was the Romans who wanted to have him killed, even though the sources are telling us just the opposite. Um, and I think most scholars, um, uh, New Testament scholars, are rather high-handed with the evidence in this way. So um, in terms of who Jesus thought he was, well, it's a little unclear because, um, you know, there certainly was a lot of uh, speculation. There were a lot of Jesus faith communities, as the saying uh, goes, that believed lots of different things about him. What we have um, in the New Testament is one faith community, which, which ended up as the Catholic Church. Uh, this faith community believed that Jesus was the incarnation of the great angel, the Son of Man, the Son of God. The Son of God is um, not God, Right. You have a son or a child, right? Right. That child is not you. I, I have two sons. They are my sons. They're not me, right? So to say the son of God is God is a little, you know, you know is, shall we say, a bit ambiguous. They thought he was the son of man, the great angel. He may have thought this himself. 
uh, because there are verses uh, in which, you know, there's one that says, you know, foxes have their um, lairs, but the son of man hath not where to uh, lay his head. Well, how do you decide whether that's genuine? Ultimately, there's not really any good way. Your criterion for deciding whether this is genuine and verses like it is going to be based on your concept of who Jesus was. So uh, if you think Jesus was, was kind of a nice guy who was kind of a wisdom preacher who wouldn't say a nasty word about anybody but somehow got crucified anyway, which is you know what, what some uh, would like to present him as, uh, well, this, he, he couldn't have said this. He wouldn't have made you know, outrageous claims. But if he did believe, he himself believed that he was the son of man, yeah, he could have done that. So it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. I, um, I mean, I think we have to at least con seriously consider the possibility that Jesus allowed his um, disciples to believe that he was uh, either <laughs> gave them to believe or allowed them to believe that he was the son of man in the sense of this. And this is what the son of man means. It does not mean if you if you like look at theologians and even New Testament scholars, they are completely clueless, absolutely completely clueless about what son of man means. Um, they're more likely to, to take these statements of Jesus's as genuine because, well, since nobody, the later church didn't even know what the son of man was by then, they couldn't have made them up. Um, and moreover, they're willing to say, well, you know, the son of man, you know, it's, it, it sounds kind of humble and not, you know, like some kind of divine incarnation. So they're kind of willing to take the Son of Man statements at, at a, uh, a little bit more uh, faith without, however, recognizing who the Son of Man was believed to be in Jesus' own time. Uh, the Son of Man, by the way, for the great angel, uh, is used in this way in Daniel 12, I believe, uh, in the Hebrew Bible. So this, is, this was not only known, uh, this was in uh, sacred scripture. Yeah, and I would agree with you about how my children are not me. And I don't know about your children, but mine are little angels, but they're also little devils. So they are a bit separate from myself. And of course, this goes right through to Paul. And as you write, and Paul's uh, taking it to more of a, the cosmic Christ levels, he and probably the early Christians never saw it as, they, as it is today where God was sort of mad at humanity and decided he was going to basically ransom himself if some have said commit suicide. But again, it goes back to the idea of the, the Kabbalah that this world was managed by angels who controlled us and Jesus just came down to sacrifice himself to liberate humanity. Yeah, I mean, the um, soteriology, the, um, shall we say, the doctrine of salvation in the New Testament is kind of vague. Um, and, you know, we'll say that, you know, Jesus um, died for our sins. Um, this, isn't, this isn't explained very well, and it's not easy to understand. How does somebody else die for your sins? Um, it doesn't even make much sense. Uh, the only conclusion I can reach is... Jesus was crucified. A number of his disciples had some experience of seeing him. Whatever that meant, they, they clearly had some experience uh, of him uh, appearing after his death. And he, my, my own personal guess is that if he appeared to them after his death, he didn't do too much explaining. <laughs> uh, and what they decided was, well, he must have died for our sins. Now, the thing about it is, Religion in those days, everywhere, was based on one thing, animal sacrifice. You sacrifice a god to the animals, I'm sorry, animals to the gods to atone for sins, to, you know, get what you want, to, you know, for protection, for, you know, uh, making sure the crops grew that year. All religion, this was not only Greek and Roman religion, but it was... Uh, part and parcel of the Jerusalem temple. The Jerusalem temple, is, um, there aren't really first-hand descriptions of it, but there is one in a text called the Letter of Aristius. And one thing that this author is particularly struck by is the incredibly elaborate plumbing system the temple had, which he describes. 
Why do they have to have this elaborate plumbing system to drain all the blood off from all the animals? Ugh. Right, if you're killing animals pretty much all day long, you're gonna, you know, and you kind of want to keep the place a little tight. You have to have an elaborate plumbing system. So this whole concept of animal sacrifice was central. Uh, so in some kind of way, and you see this in the Epistle to the Hebrews, um, Jesus became kind of this final sacrifice. Uh, and Christians didn't have to sacrifice um, animals anymore because this was the final complete sacrifice, and that was that. Um, so that was, you know, in, a, in short, there was this mysterious event, the crucifixion and, you know, apparent resurrection of Jesus, um, and for which they had no explanation, and I strongly believe none was given to them by Jesus before or even after his um, death, um, but they had to fit it into their own conceptual model, and this conceptual model was animal sacrifice. Therefore, you know, this is the per you know the Son of God incarnate is like kind of a perfect sacrifice. You know, it, it ends, up, ends up being rather contradictory itself. But this was how they understood it, or they, how they uh, made it understandable to themselves. And moving on, Richard, you uh, obviously you present a lot of data in your book how God became God. And uh, this data is what scholars are saying, uh, your own insights, uh, uh, the, the archaeology that, is, that we have at present today. And then you end up with your chapter on practical mysticism in order to give people a view on how to really uh, make this work in their daily lives. Could you uh, give the listener a little bit about this chapter? Yeah. Well, let me phrase it in terms of something we talked about a little bit earlier called the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. This kingdom of God is within you. This is what I am suggesting it means, or it means at least in part. There is something in you, that says I, that is capital I, I, the self. It is not your body, because you can kind of experience the body sensations as from a distance. It's not the mind, because you can watch thoughts in the mind also as from a distance as um, many meditative practices do it is kind of you know sometimes called the, the silent witness the watcher everybody has this because it's consciousness i mean that's it's it's you but most people are completely unaware of this fact this is maybe the, the basic thing about people it's in a sense the only real thing about us as humans but it goes completely unnoticed so it's like a treasure hidden in a field it's like leaven, which leaveneth the whole lump. Um, and in terms of practical mysticism, it's like, well, some kind of awareness and cultivation of this kingdom of God. And there are, you know, many spiritual practices um, uh, for doing this, um, you know, is, is really kind of the way to go about it, or one very, very powerful and important way of going about it. In that case, you know, your knowledge then starts to become experiential, and, you know, the external knowledge, the, you know, book learning and so on, you know, it's all very well and good, but it doesn't, um, it's no longer the sole authority. So I would, you know, point, I kind of point to people like that. And, you know, that theme of this um, I within, the true I, I sometimes call it, is a theme that really is in all of my books and um, developed more in some uh, others than in this particular one. This is more about history. But I would say that this is, you know, has to be at least what, in part what the Gospels are about. Um, and, you know, that's kind of a way of, you know, accessing some of this um, experientially in a, um, a way you can verify for yourself. For the listener, I would definitely suggest you get Richard's book, The Dice Game of Shiva. He really goes on the whole idea of consciousness, its evolution, and uh, the various uh, ideas on consciousness. Very good book for that topic, and Richard expands upon it. Uh, but another motif you also use, and this is a beautiful one, and in this one you actually do tie it to other religions and movements in history, and that's of the cosmic man. Mm hmm this is a, a universal theme um, and expressed mythically. And this can only be expressed mythically because we are not talking about events on the timeline of history, even of cos you know, uh, of uh, the history of the physical universe. And it, it said something like this. Well, this cosmic man uh, fell. That is to say, um, he descended into the earthly plane and was shattered, 
this theme of shattering um, is found in a lot of places, that in, including, um, um, I believe, Zoroastrianism, which is in the background for a lot of uh, these ideas. And these little pieces are you and me. And part of the task is this kind of cosmic reintegration of all of these little pieces into kind of one the Swedish mystic Swedenborg calls it the Maximus Homo, the uh, literally greatest human. You know, and this is, we're talking about something at a, at a metaphysical level. That we're, This is not something we're talking about, like, you know, Jesus is going to show up, um, you know, in the clouds over Dallas and going to make all of this happen. I mean, I think that's, <laughs> that's um, I think that just, just isn't going to happen that way. Um, so this reintegration uh, of the cosmic man, which not necessarily limited to, to human consciousness. I mean, we think of it that way. Why? Because we, we're anthropocentric. Why? Because we're humans and the center of our world is always going to be human. Well, that's, you know, that's kind of the way it is. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that humanity is the center of the universe, but this kind of reintegration into what, you know, was called the cosmic Christ. Uh, and I believe Paul has something like this in mind, you know, where he's, he talks about uh, you know each of us being like parts of the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ, as the Catholic Church calls it. So this cosmic reintegration uh, is you know say part of the whole task and process. Well, other religions phrase it differently. I mean, uh, Mahayana Buddhism speaks of uh, the liberation of all sentient beings, um, and uh, you know from my point of view, that's a perfectly legitimate way to see it as well. I'm using the language of Christianity here because, as I say in the book, Christianity is in the background of our consciousness. Is Christianity better than any of the other world religions? Probably not, but we're inevitably going to see uh, religion in a Christian-centered way because that is what Western civilization grew up out of. Are you free not to believe in this Christian God? Yes, but it will be the Christian God that you don't believe in. That is just what I call, or Heidegger in, uh, uh, calls, uh, our thrownness. This is the situation we're thrown into. We have to face it. Um, um, it doesn't. Uh, it, it, we have to see like, what does all this stuff mean. And, I, and so I'm trying to give some kind of meaning to this particular tradition in a way that's spiritually helpful, because a lot of the other approaches, um, you know, and this kind of goes through pretty much all the denominations and all the churches, no matter how liberal, no matter how conservative, um, uh, seem kind of often very clueless about this sort of thing. So I'm not in any denomination, so I can say what I want. Um, and uh, obviously the touchstone for every reader, or every listener is, well, does this make sense to you or not? Um, and that's ultimately the authority that we have. Um, any authority you give to someone else is authority that you give. You're, if you're you know, following a cult teacher or you're you know, believing the teachings of the Pope or something like that, well, that's authority you're turning over. It may be, from your own point of view, a good thing to do, but ultimately the authority is you and what makes sense to you. Yeah, it makes perfect sense, and it's a, again a beautiful motif. How we all, all of us, are part of the cosmic man. We all have that shard of divinity or that divine spark, and we can unify it to uh, again get, uh, get become the logos or the the son of man, and so forth. And um, the last thing, Richard, is uh, the book of uh, Revelation or the Apocalypse of John, uh, one of the most frustrating books in uh, history, which has brought a lot of problems today or especially with fundamentalists and I know like the church father Eusebius and the Martin Luther hated it they wanted that book out of there mm -hmm. uh, the consensus is that uh, that John is speaking of uh, the the Roman persecution although again obviously fundamentalists would, would vehemently disagree with this but I like how you write the simple way of getting uh, all of this uh, anxiety about revelations to simply view it as a great work of art well, you know, as I say, I quote Boris Pasternak in the book who says, all great, genuine art uh, continues and perpetuates the revelation of St. John. And Boris Pasternak was a great poet. So, you know, this is not, um, you know, this is not a statement to uh, throw away uh, uh, lightly. I, I, what I think Revelation is saying, and it does speak at cosmic levels, it is a great work of art. Um, it's a great, uh, you know, it's um, 
some of its its levels probably cannot be apprehended, uh, you know, uh, through the human mind. But to the extent that they can, this is what I think Revelation is trying to say. You'll note one thing that's repeated endlessly, you know, almost maddeningly in Revelation is the number seven. Everything is in terms of seven. When you um, are talking about seven in this kind of context, uh, the first thing you should probably look at is the realm of the seven planets as known at the time. You're counting the sun and moon, Mar Mercury, uh, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn. These, these circle the Earth because this is a geocentric worldview, and they were not only astronomical entities, but they were cosmic realms. And as you know from like the uh, uh, hermetic texts, uh, the liberation of the soul was sometimes portrayed as passing through these seven uh, levels, each of which has its own vice associated with it. And hey, that's where we got the seven deadly sins. Anyway, what it looks like Revelation is saying, because it talks about the undoing of seven seals, and um, the early part of Revelation is set in heaven with these undoing of seven seals. And then Satan is, you know, this happens in the middle of Revelation, is cast down onto earth. Um, and what it looks like it's saying is that there was some kind of cosmic purgation of these seven realms. And kind of the evil that was in them in um, the heavens, you'll notice, remember Paul talks about, uh, or Ephesians talks about, um, you know, spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, Revelation is saying that, that through the work of Christ, these um, high places are being cleaned out, and Satan is being thrown down to earth. And does, what does it say? It says and Satan was cast down onto earth. Um, and it took the form of the Roman Empire, which uh, you know was viewed as a, uh, oh, as a city. Oh, by the way, guess what? The, Roman, uh, the city of Rome was built on seven hills. And, you know, this is a city on seven mountains. I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious. So, and the idea was that Satan was embodied in this um, kind of entity of spiritual wickedness and that, you know, the next step, which hadn't taken place yet, was that Christ was going to come and destroy it and uh, make everything good, both in heaven. And uh, there was a new heaven and a new earth. That's how it, that one of the things at the end. Um, so that's what I think Revelation is saying. Uh, I mean, it is speaking to its own time, uh, but because the, it, it, it speaks in terms of very, very powerful archetypes, uh, it still speaks to us today. Now, there are other interpretations of it, and I, I would not in any way want to uh, dismiss um, a lot of these. Um, no, I don't think, you know, you know go online, you know, Barack Obama's the beast 66, <laughs> it sure he is. Yeah, well, you know, a couple of decades ago, it was... Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan or Kissinger, you know, back then it was Hitler, then it was Napoleon. It's, it's always like, you know, the, the favorite villain of the moment is always the <laughs> beast 666. Um, but so setting aside some of that, you know, there, there are other levels. Some people, there's a, uh, a, a theosophist named James Prize in the early 20th century who, um, who wrote a book called um, The Apocalypse uh, Revealed. I believe that's its title. I do mention it in my book, um, where he, you know, he talks about it in terms of sp spiritual liberation and these undoing of the seven seals or the seven seals of the chakras, and I think that could plausibly made be made as a an interpretation from a more mystical point of view. So you know, again, it can have many levels, um, and um, that's one reason it's um, so you know perennially fascinating. Um, just one little thing about. Revelation and apocalypse in general. I mean, apocalypse means literally means revelation. I mean, the title of the book in Greek is Apocalypsis, you know, apocalypse. But we don't use that term that way anymore. Apocalypse is, you know, um, you know, uh, some kind of mega disaster. Um, you know, it's conceived, um, you know, with the help of um, Hollywood's best special effects and the latest, um, you know, uh, horror, you know, the latest movie. Um, but one thing that needs to be pointed out that all of these apocalypses, and there are many, uh, you know, obviously, you know, only one of them made it into the Bible or a couple of them made it into the Bible. Their attempt to resolve the issue of cosmic justice. Life seems unfair 
And yeah, in one way, most people get what they deserve most of the time. But in another way, there's always some remnant left over. There's, you know, the innocent who suffer, the wicked who flourish. Um, you know, we've all thought about these things. And one reason apocalypse is so appealing is that it, it creates an imagined future in which all of these cosmic accounts are literally going to be tallied up. And, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, here, uh, you know, angels opening the books and that kind of thing. So the, the idea of apocalypse uh, in that sense, in the sense of the end of the world and every woman uh, being called to accounts is a way of reintroducing cosmic justice, believe in justice. I mean, human society could not exist without an innate sense of fairness. And we want the universe to be just too. And this is one way of at least hypothetically making it so. Makes perfect sense. And again, this is How God Became God by Richard Smoley. And uh, please support this show in any way you can. Uh, if you want to support this podcast, visit thegodabovegod.com. And there's many ways you can help. And certainly buy uh, Richard's How God Became God. And uh, Ten, Richard, what are you working on next? Um, I'm kind of between projects at the moment. I do a fair amount of writing articles for... Quest, which is a th theosophical journal that I edit. I also write a fair number of articles for um, an Australian magazine called New Dawn. And, you know, a lot of, you know, the ideas in this book, you know, were, you know, to some extent thought out or worked out in um, articles in, in those two magazines. So that's pretty much what I'm working on at the moment. I don't have a, a book project as such uh, in mind right now. And for the listener, if you want to read some of uh, Richard's blogs, please visit innerchristianity.com. A lot of good stuff there on all topics. And I think that's all the time we have today, Richard. I'd like to thank you very much for coming on Aeon Bide once again, gracing us with your presence and uh, discussing your great book, How God Became God. Well, as always, it's been a pleasure. Please support Aeon Bite Now Stick Radio in any way you can. A few shekels here or there. Join my Patreon campaign. Buy some of me reality disbanding, mind expanding books like Voices of Gnosticism, Heretic, or Stargazer. Subscribe to our Arch of a Past shows. Your continued donations keep this red pill cafeteria open. The various avenues to assist me are found at thegodabovegod.com. Support alternative media, away from the few corporations that own all mainstream media. I should mention that I am an Amazon.com affiliate, so any books you order from thegodabovegod.com grant me a kickback. In fact, if you order anything, whether it's clothes, appliances, or sex toys, click through the site and I will get a kickback from that as well even if you don't order anything advertised at thegodabovegod.com. Much appreciation to you, Knights of Valis, Shining Crazy Diamonds, and Rainbows in the Dark who support this blasphemy on a weekly basis. Write your own gospel and live your own myth.